Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. My guest today has lived music as a profession when there were places to play and cats could get loose on the bandstand with Charles Tolliver or Jimmy and Tootie Heath. Late shows with Woody Shaw and long before our mothers cried with Sonny Fortune. My guest is awash in all musics and drunk with sound. He has dealt with good leadership and bad. He has come to different understandings of what love is and overcome a lot of adversity in his life. It is all music, and labels and names have really gotten in the way of our ability to create spiritual communal music. The bean counters want to pigeonhole and brand music. We've gotten to a point now in our society where you go to a blues festival and there's not one black band, or you go to a jazz festival and it's just a bunch of R&B bands. My guest today is a conduit for information coming through him from the heavens. He had a chance to play with the original masters of music and learn to get out of his own way and become part of the musical conversation. Life is not always peaceful, especially if you're a professional artist. You have to know your instrument. You have to hone your sound, be a leader and a teammate at the same time, and find places to play that believe in the profession of music. That it's not a pay-to-play game, that music is to be felt, and it's not for pacification. You need to burn and go beyond the atmosphere because we will be leaving this planet for other worlds. Big Chief Donald Harrison, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hey, how are you doing today? <laughs> it's an honor to talk to you, man. You know, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, in my interviews with the late, great Charlie Neville, he talked about... Uh, Pastor Lasty's church and the drum being the spiritual connector uh, of that church. And I know you came along a little bit later, but I was wondering if you could talk about the spirit church that you attended, if you in fact did. Well, my parents <clears throat> took us to uh, all religions, and, and we had an idea of the spirituality of all people, but... My father was a big chief of four different uh, cultural groups. Uh, and they, they kept the, the spirit of Congo Square alive. So I, I, I masked with him. <clears throat> and now I, I'm the, uh, the current big chief of Congo Square. So that that's uh, one of the main places main incubator of of the world's music in fact what started there where Africans could participate in their culture in the 17 and 1800s helped to develop the sound of New Orleans music and it's still an incubator what I call offshoot Congo Square of offshoot Congo Square cultures and ultimately the cultures of the world it's a place uh, where uh, people who were living through the most dire circumstances could go and participate in their culture and develop new cultures in the, in the new world and find a place of transcendence. So uh, I always think of, of that aspect and how at these, well, these persecuted people were finding a place of transcendence. Other per people who heard it they, they they felt the freedom of the music, the spiritual connection to the universe, and uh, they did, they decided that they needed to have that in their life too, and they incorporated that into their lives, and and now you have that essence that started there as part of uh, the world culture in, in one form or another. When I taught, done a couple interviews with uh, your dear brother, Bill Summers, and he talked about essentially with this, uh, the slaves would be allowed to come on Sundays, maybe the weekends, and get stuff out of their system and play, and play rhythm and drums, and then a cannon would be fired off, which would signal that they would have to get back to their plantation. I'm, I just went down to New Orleans before the pandemic, I mean, there's a lot of beautiful statues and obviously some places to play. But in the mid-70s, can you talk, or even early 70s, can you talk about how your parents, specifically your father, 
how he was adding to the lineage and keeping the 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 lineage of Congo Square alive. Yeah, well, he was uh, he's one of the people that was connected to what we call the old time ways. He came up with the old time chiefs, and he uh, knew all all the moves to make because it's a secret culture. So he he shared with shared that information with younger generations, including myself. If they earn the uh, the chance through through being what we would call human beings mm-hmm. to, to get the information, you have to you have to be a human being to get the inside information. So uh, it's a way to help people find who uh, I would say the best way to look at society and help each other. Uh, through culture and music, so that, that's what he was. What basically what he was doing, uh, just like you know, jazz musicians do. I always look at it in the same way as me playing with the great jazz musicians of them sharing the information from their perspective, so that we could carry forth and uh, and teach the young people. How to, how to look at the fullness or the wholeness of their lives. I, I came up with a, with a statement about what we do. It's called Roots. The statement is Roots to Infinity. Hmm. So that's basically what it is, you know. Like my father said, if you want to know something about the culture, you got to start at Mother Africa. And then, then you move forward from there. So we're, we're that connector, one of the connecting uh, groups in America that that still has that sound of antiquity from the beginning, and uh, and what we do. Can you talk about specifically the? I mean, I remember. I mean, they call um, in diaspora. Um, you know, they call <laughs> religious drumming in Cuba Santeria. That's a, a Latin word. Uh, that's not an African word. They tried, the the co- the slave owners colony colonists tried their best to strip the motherland uh, traditions and from the, the slaves. And I, I just wanted to know specifically what is something, I agree, it, it all starts in the motherland. What is, what is something that, that was part of the, that you can share that that remains integral to your people that had that you've tried to keep uh, within your soul uh, because so much of the language and the traditions they were co-opted and turned into uh, words that weren't you know they weren't the Af- everything was taken away and I just I wanted you to talk from your own point of view about something that you believe in this day and age especially with what we're going through in this country right now, if you could talk about specifically something that has stayed in your soul that you continue to try to promote uh, from your, you know, from your cultural heritage. Yeah, I mean, one of the main ideas is that your ancestors walk with you and that you're connected to your ancestors. Mm-hmm. That's, that's part of, of New Orleans cultures. And, uh, we don't think we don't think of them as separate, you know. So a lot of times, when when someone leaves this plane, they just say they're with the ancestors now, and and you can call up uh, the ancestors in the culture, and and we're we're all one on both sides of it. So. Uh, can you t- can you talk about like can you talk about when you you know the feeling you had when you con- connecting with your ancestors? I mean, I believe you. I I know what you're saying. I I have my own feeling about it. I'm not a musician, um, right? But I I just know like Cyril Neville, his folks took him to a Catholic school and they were speaking Latin and he didn't mean a damn thing to him. And the minute he walks up to Pastor Lasty's church, the rhythm that was coming out of there, that resonated. And we know 
what descarga or whatever that spiritual discharge of rhythm can do. And I, do you remember an early time when this was validated to you, when you realized that there was a direct connection to your ancestors and you're just visiting this planet? Yeah, I, mean, I think I've, I've always had that understanding because uh, from any, any conscious, on any conscious level, I was always around the culture. My mother <laughs> tells me when I was a baby that the drummers would come to my house and they would be singing. Mm-hmm. And when they left, I was I would be playing the rhythms on the crib. I love, baby crib. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she was, uh, and I was always beating on everything. So uh, they thought I was going to be a drummer until my father bought me a saxophone but I've always I've always uh, had a special connection but I had another uh, connection and, and and the people inside of the culture would tell you uh, when you're making your cultural attire something comes over you too that's inexplainable but it, but you feel the connection to everything when when you're inside the culture it's it's a when you participate in the culture, it's a certain transcendence that takes you to a place you you, you know, uh, a peace and calm. You don't know how, but you're there, mm. and, and and once you feel that feeling, it's with you for the rest of the life, for the rest of your life, and you have to do it. It's it's compelling you to be in this state all the time. So, uh, and I just call it a state of, of one with the universe. And however you think, I can't tell other people how to think of it, whether it's spiritual or from the Buddhist uh, state of mind, but you you know, there's no worries. It's just that you you're in the middle of everything. I love it. You're, you're in the flow. It. Yeah, you're in the flow and at peace and and you yeah. can and you can feel the spirit. I mean, going back to your upbringing, I mean, you were banging on the crib and hanging and having a ball, but by the early 70s um the can you just talk about you said your father oversaw four tribes, is that correct? He was he was a chief of four tribes in his lifetime. Yeah, I want you to talk specifically because Big Chief Tootie Montana and uh, Bo Dallas, uh, early seventies. You can push back and correct me if I'm wrong, but the tribes were killing each other. Did, did your did can you talk about how your dad said, "Hey guys, we, you know we might have some different costumes or maybe slightly different techniques or whatever, but let's stop killing each other." Can you talk about how, uh, if your dad dealt with that and where you fit into all of that, because it, that was a serious time on top of all the disruption that was caused by the police. Well, you know, uh, in, in tribal culture, you have something called warriors, right? In Africa, you have something called warriors. Yeah. So can you imagine being enslaved and then deciding you wanted to to be free. So you had to pull up everything. You had to be ready to face everything to get your freedom. So there's always going to be an element of uh, Challenging, challenging each other, so to prepare you for what life really is. So every element of life is 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 uh, people who don't understand. It, every element of life is present. You can't negate one part of it, of of your existence. You have to have all of it to be prepared to survive. Um, I, I mean, that, no, I'm, I mean, you're, no, it's deep, man. I mean, it's, I mean, how, 
I, you know, in my intro, I, I talked about labels and, you know, I, me and bro, uh, Chief, oh, Big Chief Harrison could walk down the street and ask 20 different people what their definition of the word jazz is and we get 20 different answers. But were you, did they use labels to, for the music or was it just about spiritual awakening in the moment? I'm just trying to figure out when, when your dad bought you the horn and maybe when you first started to get on the bandstand, Tyler's Beer Garden, H&M, and, H and H and w what was the club that the, that the Indians played at? There were cigarette machines there. Um, there were there were a lot of clubs. It was each tribe has their own practice, so that's the way that goes. And then, but there's a lot of stuff we we don't really enunciate. It's just that the, the, this is the I'll say it like this: this is the closest thing to being in an African tribe in America that I know of, and it feels the music of New Orleans and consequently the music of the world. So basically that's it. And, uh, and, and, uh, and we do it for us. And, uh, trust me, there's always a challenge on every level. And anybody who says that they didn't do it, it's just telling you anything because the chiefs are not going to tell people they have no, no uh, idea that they have to explain exactly what we're doing to anyone. It's because it's not for everyone unless they want to come in and be a human being inside of it. I dig. So they they might say anything to you because they, they they don't, and they they have their reasons for saying it, but they're never going to tell you this is what's going on. Unless you earn it by being a human being. That's the part of it. That people don't hear me when I'm saying that. So it's not, uh, you have to come inside to understand it. Once you come inside, then you'll understand it. And you have to earn the right to come inside of it. How, how did you earn, aside from familial bonds, I mean, I don't think your dad gave you a free pass because you were blood. I mean, how did you earn it? You just have to be a human being. Yeah, that's a slippery slope these days, man. I mean, I mean, it's always been, but I'm just saying. I mean, I, I try to lead with my heart. I try to rare. I, I just say this: it's it's, a, it's the choice of knowing of, of working towards the best answer. That's what humans human beings do. What what is the best answer for this dilemma we're facing? Hmm. And, and that and the search for that. You you said that that the 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 ensemble the closest thing to uh, African tribal music. Uh, you know when you when you when you break that down on a granule level uh, granule level, do you just is it about a communication? You are actually using language to communicate. Um, to can you talk specifically about how the correlation between your tribe and the music you create is the closest thing to African tribal music? Just because, um, you know, I mean, the greatest cats that in this world, uh, I mean, America's only true art form is what we call jazz, but it did start with that tribal communication, but I wasn't sure, you know, I mean, if, if, what are the similarities? How does it make it so authentic? Well, for me, first off, if you have a, an inkling of uh, what music sounds like, you will hear it immediately, you know, and uh, you can hear the essence of where things come from. If you've listened to a, a little bit of music and, and lived a life and heard various uh, ways that groups of uh, humans get together and play music, so you hear the source of of it immediately to me. So anybody can listen to it and say, "Oh, that sounds like this. That sounds like this." 
And then you, then you understand that, that aspect of it. And that's that's basically all it is. But we we know we know uh, if the uh, different places that, in Africa that influence what we do, and we know the, con- the, the there's a handful who knows the connectors who who are really on the inside, and they when you start going up levels inside of something. You know, just it's the same with jazz. You start going up levels, more ideas are revealed. Of how you, uh, you know, the, what I call the upper partials of the music mm. through through uh, the experience and, and uh, guys who really have that uh, idea of the, the to- of a total picture, more more of an idea of a total picture. They can start sharing that with you. Because in the beginning you're just a, a novice, and you're trying, and they can only they can only go so far with you until you keep doing it over and over and over, and you start gaining the experience. So it's the same thing in the culture. You have to be there. You have to keep making the right choices, and then when they see that you're making the choices we talked about before, then they start saying, "Oh, he's ready to get to this level. Let's show him." And then you you, uh, you become one of the people who's in that inner circle, who's doing the same thing that the that the older generations did to you, to younger people. So I'm always looking for the, the next people I can uh, pass down this information to that has been given to me. Did you have an opportunity to go? Uh, on a, on a touring circuit, I, I mean, again, going harkening back to Earl Palmer, Alan Toussaint, Charlie Neville. I mean, these guys were going to, you know, they were playing Jack's Fiesta Club or you know, Club Handy. And I, I'm just wondering, like, what you're talking about specifically is the language. What do you mean? The language of the, the culture, or the language of music. The language. What I'm saying is, I think you find your individual voice, and I think you 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 move up these levels of music by being on the bandstand. And part of the issue today is well, that I, I just say this: I've been on two. I played with 250 jazz masters from every era of jazz. I play with the people who made up funk with James Brown. I play with rock and rollers. I've written symphonic orchestras. I did. No, no, I'm just talking yeah, about... I'm just, yeah. I'm just telling you, you're talking about who the elders I'm giving you specifically. I play with musicians who were playing in New Orleans in the 20s. I play with... I took Johnny Hodges in the Duke's Men. Johnny Hodges plays in the Duke's Men. I play with Art Blakey, uh, Max Roach, Philly Joe Jones, Miles Davis... And I could just go on and on. Tony Williams, Elvin Jones, McCoy, Tyner, you know, uh, played it with Afro-Cuban musicians, Chuck Jobaldo, played with uh, Afro-Puerto uh, Ricans, Ed Palmieri, for a long time in his band. Wow. I played with Afro-Brazilian musicians, musicians from uh, uh, Peru, Haiti, Africa, <laughs> Europe. So I, I have, I've had, I played smooth jazz. I played uh, <laughs> almost any genre of music. You talk about, I've played with the greatest, the master innovators from almost every style of music that you can imagine and been on the bandstand with them. And the work that it took to play with just one style of music, it takes a lot of work for the greatest, the master innovators like I just talked to Ron Carter. I'm I play with him. I've been playing with him for fifteen years. Roy Haynes, I stayed with him for fifteen years. We played with Charlie Parker. You know, and those guys taught me Miles, uh Roy Haynes, Walter Bishop, uh no, dear, Art right. Blakey. Man, man. They they taught me what Bird taught them. So and I played with McCoy Tyler and he taught me what Train taught taught him play with Elvin Jones so I if they if the musicians that I looked up to were a lot weren't here anymore 
I played with the people that played with them. And I got the lessons from them. So uh, I'm one of the guys who really did a tremendous amount of work out here every day, practicing all these different styles of music so that these masters would consider me playing with them and consider that I was worthy for them to pass this information on to me. So you talk about work ethic. I don't know nobody like me. I don't know nobody who's played uh, the people you're talking about. I don't know nobody who's played with all the styles of music. I played with Alan Tucson. He was my advocate. I played with Dr. John. He was my advocate. They did a ton of stuff for me. So you're talking about people, somebody who played the dues and specifically played with everybody from every era, Cecil Taylor and free jazz, down pulling uh, soul jazz with Dr. Lonnie Smith, uh, and just everybody. I've been there, bro. I've been there, bro. I, no, I, I did. I'm, I'm, I was specifically at, trying to figure out because when you first went on went on the Chitlin circuit or actually left New Orleans. I, never, I, I, didn't, I didn't really go on a Chitlin circuit because I left New Orleans at, at 18 and I was playing in New York at 19. So, okay, so you went to New York and... When I played, when I played in New Orleans, they had laws that you couldn't play. So when I, whenever somebody gave me a gig, a lot of times I had to play behind a curtain because I was too young to be in the club. Unbelievable. <laughs> like, it was Hayes' Chicken Shack still around? No, I'm just talking about... Uh, no, I, I, was, I, I, I didn't start playing music until 76. So I was in the brass band. I could play in the brass bands. So I was in that. But when, whenever older guys called me to play in a club, unless it was that Lou and Charlie's, was, which is a jazz club, he just let us play and come, come in there. But it was really against the law. So most of the time, if I was playing in a club, playing R&B or soul music in high school, I was hidden somewhere playing. But I was still having a good time. Oh, I, I, I mean, I was. I mean, you came up. It was the, one of the most righteous periods. Uh, can you talk about the opportunity? Who gave? Was it Blakey that gave you the opportunity to come to New York? No, I started in New York with Roy Haynes when I was nineteen. So Roy, Roy, Roy saw you in New Orleans. Was like, hey man, come, come be in my no, band. No, I was, I was a student in, in, in Berkeley. Oh, and so I visited to New York, and then we had a jam session. And Roy Haynes heard me, and he said, he, he called me over, he said, Bird has been born again in you. <laughs> That's what he told me the first time he met me. Wow. And and I was and so he said, I want you to join my band. And I just had a minute, he could tell that I love Charlie Parker. I had a million questions about Bird. And he started telling, telling me. And then he told all, all the other older guys, this young guy, he he really wants it. We got to take care of him. So all of them started taking care of him. So you, um, coming to New York in the late seventies, though, um, can you talk about was what was Harlem like at that time, and also what were essentially the the venues to play? I remember Hubert Eaves when he first moved to New York. He was playing with. Bill Lee, who's obviously Spike Lee's father, and it was Thelonious I, Monk's birth. I was, I was in Bill Lee's band. Oh, I spent like three years with Bill Lee. Well, back in the, in the late 70s when I went to Harlem, I was playing with a brother, Jack McDuff. Oh, my. So we were playing all, all the clubs that were left. What was left but at that time, if you don't mind me asking? Was I can't. I'm bad with names. Uh, right. No, I mean, maybe the, 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 maybe the three deuces was there. I can't remember. But we played like uh, Showman's was there. We played like three or four clubs in, in Harlem. But it was the, the gigs were heavily attended. It was the clubs would be packed and the people would be enjoying. Maybe I, I did some shit in circus stuff with Jack McDuff because he played everywhere. Oh, my. You went, wait, we, you, we, we went like upstate New York with a Hearst? No, he had a a big van, a big white van. Oh, that is that so classic! In. So, were you going upstate New York, Rochester area? No, we went all over the United States. 
He traveled all over the United States. Can you talk? So a, I mean, because how? What are the biggest crises facing younger cats? There are plenty of younger cats that are hungry, that are curious. You're always looking to pass that information on, but now there is no viable touring circuit in my mind. You got one nighters, or you go to Europe for thirty gigs in thirty four days. I mean, what in your mind are the biggest challenges facing? You just riffed off. You played with all the original masters. All those cats were on the road 200 plus days a year. And at least with melodic improvisation, that doesn't exist anymore. And I just wonder, in your mind, what are the challenges facing younger cats? And I don't want to say how do we solve them, but what are your, what are your, how do we move forward here? You know, uh, just getting people to understand that this music exists in every forum that we can. And and for me, uh, for the musicians, in, in terms of what I do, I play music that comes from the people because I, it's my belief that if the music comes from the people, the musicians have respect for the people. And if the music comes from them, they're going to understand it and love it. And then you, you, for me, then you can't lose. It's, it's learn as much as you can, play from your heart. And have respect for the people in your music. Part of it's also, that's what, that's yeah. What, that's what we need to do. Because, uh, you know, great Art Blakey, he told me, if you present an idea to the world, and the world needs that idea, they'll be the path to your door. Hmm. So, always, so, you know, sometimes it ain't on the other side. It's on us. To, you know, we're inventors and creators and people who keep uh, culture alive. But we can't lose touch. I was telling somebody about what Bird said. Uh, talk about Bird a lot with Charles McPherson, another great alto, alto saxophonist. A dear friend, yeah, I love him. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, another gentleman was telling me Bird told him can't remember who it was. Don't let the music go too far from the people. So all of those little things that these people are of incredible statues have shared with me, I try to remember it. And it has helped me, I think, uh, tremendously. To be, We talked about the transcendence in the, in the beginning and being connected. So... We have to we have to keep all all the ideas open and be open to them and connect on 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 a one to one level and on a in a communal level with all the people we can and just you know even uh, the guys who came from New Orleans said when they left New Orleans people didn't understand the music they were playing initially. But they got to understand it. So you got to keep, just keep doing what you do, man. And eventually, it'll add up for you. I've I taught a lot of great people, and they're doing well. They're, they're touring, you know, as much as they want. I've got I help stu my students get millions of dollars worth of scholarship. Some of the more notable students who came to, uh, Work with me would be and, and rap music to Notorious B.I.G. You can look that up. I uh, I met the Notorious B.I.G. for about eight years, and he became the king of East Coast rap. Absolutely. But, but there's there's what we were doing with him uh, was working on positive affirmations for individuals inside <laughs> what was being played on the radio and danced to uh, of his generation. So the reason he has all these murals all over the world is he was telling young people, believe in yourself, work hard. So if somebody says that you're nothing, don't believe it. Everybody's something. There's all these positive affirmations. And I know that because I taught him uh, 
to put that in there. I love this. But you're telling me when he came to you, he was riffing more on the negative side of, of humanity. And then you... uh, he, I mean, he needed a lot of help musically. But, uh, and, and there's things I did with the music. I had him uh, learn how to uh, rhyme like a jazz drummer, use the rhythms of a jazz drummer. So it's just a lot of different elements uh, and what he, um, what we got to between what I was showing him and his uh, understanding of young people. But I was, yeah, basically, I was saying you can use all of this, use the universe inside what you're doing and tell a story that hopefully helps some young people. <clears throat> you know, you went to Berkeley at a time when the combat zone was still alive. Uh, uh, I guess what I'm saying is, do you really, you talked about raising millions of dollars, getting millions of dollars in scholarships. I just, after talking to you and hearing your thoughts, do you really truly think that the music of, the music that we've been talking about can be codified in a curriculum. It's a street language. It always has been a street language. Uh, the music, music comes from everywhere. Yeah, but it's all in the academy now. It, it comes from everywhere. Certain parts can come from an academy. Certain parts can come from uh, engaging. But I, I don't. I don't agree with the, the term street because it comes. There's black music, or music in churches. There's music in houses, music in concerts, music in parades. It comes from everywhere. It comes from people. The sound of music does not come from the street. It comes from people. Mm. And you encounter people everywhere. So it's just what you can get from each. There's things I learned from colleges. There's things I learned from musicians. Things I learned from people, just regular people who don't even play music that helped me to... Uh, understand how to play music so we have to for me i can't say everybody i have to say for me i think we have to stop saying it comes from one only one source charlie parker they two uh, said two sentences that summed up everything for me and the, the set and the phrase the quotes are uh they teach you that music has boundary lines but it doesn't. And he said, the other statement is, if you don't live it, it won't come out of your horn. So that's big. You can't tell a story you haven't lived. So all, it's just, it's just each person has lived a different story. So we respect this story. And some people, young people that are coming out of college, you can't expect them to have 30 years of life experience in their playing. They have to go live the 30 years. So you, you expect a, a college kid and all he's d done is be in college to have the same feeling as someone who's been out there for 30 years and now they're 50 years old and they've lived life, been in relationships and understood, uh, getting get to the point where they understand what they want to do to a higher level. A 22-year-old can't do that. So let's let's give let's give them a break and let them live some life. Well, no, but so, I want I want I want to yeah. I want to agree with you. But a lot of the cats yeah. that from your generation and younger didn't even finish their degrees because there was gigs and they could sing for their supper on the bandstand. Now you're going into the right. academy and you you're going into massive debt. You're not even sure. And then the other issue is just the homogenization of sound. Cats are coming out sounding like their professors. It's just to me there are. I agree with you. I, I think it's inspiring that you learn about music from people who don't even play music. But I'm just saying that when you went to Berkeley, you weren't having jam sessions in the cafeteria. You were playing Pooh's Pub or you were going to the Combat Zone playing three sets a night. And I don't think you were more than 20 years old. So you had... We had all of it. We had... There was a guy that who came from Kansas City. His name is Tim Bone Williams. And he used to organize jam sessions with the students all the time. So we played. We played in in the clubs, and if when the, you know, I had fortunately Berkeley actually uh, the school got me the chance to play when they when they would have some of the great masters come through. They would call me and, and let me play with them. 
So the first time I played with Sonny Stitt was out of Berkeley. Uh, that's how I met him, because Berkeley put me together with him and, and a lot of other guys. Hmm. So it, uh, schools has schools have uh, can be detrimental if if the teacher doesn't tell the student to check out everything and be open, because there are some teachers who try to steer a student in their direction, and I don't think that's the right way. So if a teacher is doing that, then they may mess up a student. But we want what well, we should be teaching these students is to. Uh, to believe in themselves, and, and through time they will find their own sound, and just keep working towards that with everything they they have. I tell my students, music is like a bank account; you can't take out nothing you didn't put in. <laughs> you know, so and they understand it. I dig. I, I I just give you a couple of my students. There's a guy named John Baptiste. Yeah. Who's my student? Oh yeah. I mentored uh, Esperanza Spalding, my nephew Christian Scott, trombone shorty. And that's just that's a few of them. But they're everywhere in all types of music because I never told them to follow me. I just said, let's just learn as much as we can. Yeah, I will say the ones, the names you just dropped, they're all carving their own path, I mean, which is a testament to, to you. Before I let you go, and thank you for taking the time, brother, I... um. I want to believe that you first connected with Bill Summers and Mike Clark uh, when the Headhunters. Did you see the Headhunters a after they left Herbie and they were just a band, the Headhunters? When did you first connect with those guys? I, I actually saw the Headhunters with Herbie. Oh, and boy. So, but I, did, I didn't meet them back then. What I mean, was your What I was your impression I, of, uh, did you see them at Paul's Mall, the Jazz Workshop, or were they in New Orleans? Do you remember? No, I saw the, the original had on this well a band with Mike and uh, Bill and Paul Jackson and Herbie in France. In well, France, they, they did a tour called a Re Return of the Headhunters. Wow! But anyway, uh, I've I've been following the Headhunters since they came on the radio in the late seventies, whenever that was. I heard Chameleon and and Watermelon Man on the radio. And just love the tunes, but uh, I I, don't, I, don't, I can't tell when I'm. I know I've been with, with them at least over a decade, maybe two decades. Yeah, I think it's probably twenty years. I just wanted you to talk yeah. about this this new album. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. You know these guys are always uh, stretching who they are to the 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 seek. They're always seeking the next sound. The, the next logical sound. So it's just fun to, to be around these guys who are sound craftsmen. <laughs> and as, as Bill Bill would say, uh, we're uh, musicians who think of themselves as healers uh, and be part of their process. You know, so, so many people. This another group. Where you, I'm on the bandstand pitching myself because I used to listen to these guys, <laughs> and, and now that they have me up there playing with them, and they telling me that I'm worthy to be there, because you know, when you're young, like when I first started, it, and you listen to the people that you you think of them, you put them on a pedestal, and now they say they saying you you come get on a pedestal with me, it's still unbelievable every night, and this. This band knows they have what I call they know how to rock the house and get to that place of transcendence where you see people in the audience dancing with their eyes closed and just in that place that you you know that the music is taking them. It's a wonderful, incredible uh, sight to see and be part of. And I think this new record captures the the head of us in the in a new light, and uh, it's also a vehicle for musicians to learn another way to look at music. It's pushing the envelope. So everything they do is important. It's just, this is this step right now. In the future, there'll be another step. So it's, it's, the, it's just the next step for the headhunters and, and the sound and concept of what they do. Um, 
if there's one area that you want to push yourself out of your comfort zone uh, personally or musically, uh, what would it be? I don't know. I just, uh, I think I'm, a, I'm always pushing, as far as pushing myself or, uh, out of my comfort zone, I do that every day. <laughs> yes, always. I dig. It's, so, uh, that's how you grow, yeah. yeah. That's, how, that's how I live. But right now I'm working on... Uh, Bach has something called a well-tempered clavier. Hmm. So yeah, uh, I know that. That, that. Yeah, that was basically where he put together the concept of how we would look at Western harmony. So uh, one day I was looking at what he did, and I came up with another, the next step for how you could deal with that. So I have a lot of work to do. And then developing that, that's, that's going to be a, a, another lifetime project. I'm always on lifetime projects. But I, I've been working on that for the last year now. So I, I think in about five years, I'll be, be ready to present it because I have to really start over like a child, or like, like learning your ABCs to develop uh Actually, what I know is is the next, not the only next step, but a next step for how we can look at music and how it can be organized, or just the harmonic aspect of it. So when when you when you just keep keep your mind open and your ideas open, you keep finding new ideas. I was dealing with quantum physics and jazz. I have a new single coming out called "The Magic Touch" that deals with the multiverse and omniverse. Uh, idea in a musical context. So, uh, wow. I hope that that people look look for this. And and one thing the older musicians used to tell me uh, was that all music is the same. And I was I listened to them. I said it all sounds different to me. But then I, I realized one day that uh, it is the same because we're all using the same twelve notes. We're all using the same rhythms. It's just how we deal with it. But we're all using the same elements. It's when a guy gets on the piano, if you put a uh, Horowitz on the p- piano, yeah, he he's playing the same twelve notes that McCoy Tyne is playing. That's the same piano, so it, it is the same thing. And then I, I, I further thought, you know what? It's the same in cooking. If you take a chicken and you bring it to China. They're going to do something with that chicken that speaks to who they are. Then you take it to Jamaica, and they're going to jerk it. You take it to France, it's going to be coke or however you pronounce Absolutely. that. Absolutely. You bring it to New Orleans, they're going to give you some smothered chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same chicken, but we're doing what we do with it. And I, I started understanding what these older gentlemen meant when they were saying, all music is the same. So this this new concept for me is showing that same idea, and and that's the another step for humanity realizing we all have a, a nose, a face, and all the all the same things, but we all each nose is different, but we're all brothers and sisters, and we should be working together and realizing we all are the same on that level to love each other and become human beings. Donald Harrison, I hope we can do another set down the road, man. I really love your vibe, and I look forward to seeing you play in person sometime. Um, You know, my whole goal of my show is to make sure that, uh, not that the music continues, but that our our society here, at least in the West, will will see the musician as a viable profession and not some pay-to-play or play for the door, you know, I mean, to me, musicians in this day and age are as important as medical doctors and rhythm is very healing. And I know you agree with that. I agree a hundred percent. I I mean, what you're doing right now with having myself and other uh, artists that you have on your show, you're doing what you, what you, uh, you say needs to be done. And that's all we can do, you know, and get up every day. Going back to Art Blake, you say, light your candle. 
And if one person sees it and it helps their life, then your life I is love, worth it. Well, you know, that was the thing that he told Stafford James. Uh, yeah. He goes, my job, Blake, he said, my job is to wash away the dust of everyday life for all the patrons right. that come in here. I love that. I've used that line over and over, and that's that's all I want to do. An artist... Artist's job is to inspire other is to inspire other people, and that's all I want to do. So if I can give you a little extra energy, go out and do some quantum physics and get the next level of music, uh, then do it, baby. Yeah, we're we're all on the same team, and we're basically all doing the same thing, but, but we all have a different role to do it. So it's it's just good to connect with everybody on your shows and any other show that we can. And it's great that you. You give us a format to talk about what we do and that we can reach people and get on the same page, man. Get on the good foot, man. Have a ball. I, I guess you're going on tour with the Hunters pretty soon, or is that when? Yeah, is... we're on tour now. I'm in Seattle. Right oh, now. dude, have a. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm getting ready to catch a flight to uh, San Francisco, so your interview is right before I'm leaving. All right, do it. Yo, safe travels and, and get people dancing, baby. I love that. That's me, baby. Yeah, yeah man. I, I will, uh, we'll, I'll see you soon, uh, Big Chief. Thank you so much. All right. You take care. Cheers. All right. Bye.